thanks for joining us colleagues. Welcome to Scottish colleagues here for the first time. Um, this is the weekly uh, Great Manchester briefing, joined by Sir Richard uh, Lees, uh, who will take you through the latest um, uh, health stats in, in a moment. We've also got Baroness Beverly Hughes, who will uh, be providing an update on the gender-based violence strategy, which is, which is about to go out to formal uh, consultation. Uh, and then, of course, as ever, we'll get into your into your questions. So let's start with the health uh, position and I'll hand over to Sir Richard Lees. Richard. Uh, thanks, Andy. We're going to go through, uh, I think, the usual set of uh, slides, although I think we should be able to do most of them fairly uh, quickly. So if we could put the first slide up, that'd be really useful. First slide, as always, deals with the overall prevalence uh, uh, rate. And when we get it, you will see that apart from Bolton and uh, Stockport, which both have had a, a decline over the last seven days, uh, everywhere else has an increase, uh, which is clearly not good news. But uh, the increase over the past seven days is at half the rate of the previous seven days. So uh, it looks that, that we are beginning to uh, move to uh, the cap really so the, the rate of increase is slowing slowing down uh say more about this when we get to the third slide but if we move to the uh, over 60s slide the prevalence rate in over 60s again you see small increases there but uh, i think also the impact of vaccination that you don't see the same rate of increase in over 60s as you uh, uh, see in the overall age, age groups and we're certainly finding that where people have had a double vaccination that the rate of uh, in infection there is very low indeed which again i'll talk about when we get on to uh, hospitals uh, if we move to the third slide and again this is probably in many respects the most informative uh, slide and you will see that uh, the massive number of cases are in that 16 to 29 uh, age group uh, if we were to break that down even further, we'd find it's actually in the 16 to 24 end of that uh, uh, age group. And um, again, it's a, a fair number of cases in 11 to 16 as, as well. So uh, the transmission issues are predominantly amongst young people. I said that that is a, not a particular issue of, of illness. And a lot of this is uh, uh, testing of asymptomatic people, although there are cases of illness, of, of course, with, within that. Uh, but it, that level of transmission does still increase the risk of new variants and uh, we are seeing a, an awful lot of young people having to uh, lose even more school time as a consequence. So I can say, for example, in, in Manchester alone, there are 2, 000, over 2,000 pupils isolating at, at the moment. There is work going on with Public Health England about whether we can find ways, particularly through daily testing, of instead of having to self-isolate, keeping uh, as many pupils in school as possible. But that's still work in progress and it's being piloted. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, this is continues to be good news around care homes. By definition, people who are uh, more prone to illness are, tend to be frailer. Uh, but again, it shows the benefit of vaccination that the cases in care home residents very very low across the whole of greater manchester moving rapidly on um now see the impact on uh, hospital uh, beds an increase in cases but again if we were to compare with uh, january february march the number of uh, hospital admissions compared to the prevalence is nothing like what we had uh, then we're probably running at about uh, well, probably between 50, maybe 15% 15 of, uh, of cases uh, compared to the peak back in uh, February and, and, and March. And similarly, the, the number of people translating into intensive care is still relatively low uh, as well. Um, I've said it in previous weeks that there, there is pressure on our hospital system, uh, not particularly out of COVID. COVID is not stopping the elective recovery. Uh, work. It is simply the sheer number of people, particularly going into uh, A&E, that are putting pressure on the system. Hospitals are, it's quite easy to count uh, the numbers, see the numbers and 
uh, describe the pressure that they're under and there is pressure throughout the entire health and uh, care system and I think uh, Jen Williams is on the call I know uh, colleagues in primary care are really grateful for the piece that was done uh, over the weekend setting out uh, the real issues that are being faced not just by GPs but in uh, the whole of community services uh, as well and I think we appreciate that there is some frustration from patients who think that uh, everything's returned to normal but uh, we've, we're seeing demand levels in some places 30 35 percent above pre-covid levels and at the same time it's pharmacists and gps who are delivering a, a vaccination program a long-term vaccination program over and above what they would be doing normally as, uh, as well so uh, we do want to try and get over to the, the public at large that uh, gps and pharmacists and the other part dentists uh, other parts of primary health are really doing uh, their best, but they are trying to meet unprecedented demand uh, with the same level of resources that they've had previously. And, uh, and again, we need to do everything we can to try and uh, help them meet patients' needs, but not uh, uh, push them under, really. And, and I think we need to try and get over a, a level of sympathy for what's going on with primary health as well. Um, I'll move to the last slide, which is a vaccination slide. Um, shows overall performance. 50% uh, of all adults have now had the uh, second dose. Uh, you see that 91% of uh, 70 pluses have had their <coughs> second dose. Uh, return, if I comment, take that in a, alongside the previous slide, we are finding that if older people are being hospitalized, it does tend to be people who uh, only had one dose or have had no doses, but also uh, some cases where people have had both doses, but also have other frailties and other comorbidities as well. But there, there is certainly an enormous vaccination impact. And again, there's data published earlier this week that shows two doses uh, of uh, AstraZeneca or Pfizer gives you around about 90% pr uh, protection. So we are urging everybody as soon as possible to get their second dose. That's going pretty well at the moment, and there is a 94.6% a, a second dose conversion uh, at, at the moment, which is really, really good. Um, if you were to compare Greater Manchester's performance with national performance on vaccination, uh, it would appear to be around about 8% behind the national average, but that is because we have a younger population than the national average. We have far more people uh, in cohorts in 11 the uh, 31 to 30, 39 year olds and in cohort 12, the 18 to 29 year olds. Once you take, so i.e. people are only just being offered a vaccine now. Once you take age into account, then we are operating pretty much at the uh, national average. And from uh, my other role point of, point of view, uh, that impact is particularly felt in the city of Manchester because Manchester has 32% of Greater Manchester's uh, cohort 12. So uh, that clearly has an impact on what the figures are for uh, for the city. And I'll finish with that, Andy. Great. Thanks, Thanks very much, indeed, Richard. So I'm going to hand straight over to Bev, who's going to take us through the latest uh, on the gender-based violence strategy. Bev, over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. I have got a very small number of slides just to help uh, put a framework round, round this. Um, if today we're, we're actually moving towards the formal consultation on the strategy. Uh, I spoke to colleagues um, about this just before the local elections when we brought forward um, the publication of where we were up to at that point in the development of the strategy following the death of Sir, Sarah Everard and the, and the public out outpouring of, of outrage um, and we thought it right to uh, put, put this document as it was then in the public domain and invite uh, anybody informally to, to contact us. So it's been on the website since the end of March uh, and we have had some responses. I, I went quite in quite a detailed way through the content when I last spoke uh, to you. So I'm not going to go in so much detail about the content today. Um, but really focus on the process and, and how I think you can actually help me. Um, but what we're about here, learning from other cities across the world, um, is a 10-year process 
with the aim of radically transforming our approach to gender based violence. And, and that is about having a, a whole system approach to the prevention and the mitigation of the effects of uh, violence that's, that's predicated on the basis of gender. That is largely about male violence towards women and girls, uh, but not exclusively uh, about that, because it does include gender based violence uh, by others towards men and, and boys, too. And fundamentally, you know, the 10 year um, time scale is, is because on the advice of colleagues elsewhere in the world, they're saying that, look, you know, if you're going to have this radical ambition, ultimately, no matter what you do about really improving the experience of victims and survivors, really improving the response of the criminal justice system, really integrating um, the contribution of education, of health, of the voluntary sector. Fundamentally, this has got to be about changing attitudes and about changing culture, because that is what underpins this really prevalent problem now, which, as I said last time, is a global problem that's been going on for generations and we really have to have to stop it. So ultimately, changing the story means changing attitudes and values and culture um, of everybody and particularly addressing that to, to men and boys. And that means mobilising all our citizens and all of the people who contribute to our, our civic and, and public uh, and public service life here in Greater Manchester. So the start will be a concerted campaign to get the message out, to get people involved um, in this process, and then building on that uh, to, to move towards the objectives of the strategy. And primarily, apart from prevention, it is around supporting victims and survivors. Uh, that will include the establishment, as this slide says, of a diverse panel of people to help us do that. People who have direct experience of being caught up uh, in gender-based violence. And, and that is because you know, there's two premises built into this strategy. One is that the victim and survivor voice and experience has to be front and center of what we do and how we do it. And you, we have to do that if we really want to prevent other women and girls and others falling prey to gender-based violence in the future. And the second premise is that policing and criminal justice, important though they are, um, cannot be the only response to this problem because it is a societal problem. And we have to have that whole system approach that looks also at meeting the needs of children and young people, that means involving education and schools and colleges, seeing if we can actually change the behaviour of perpetrators, improving, obviously, policing and criminal justice, integrating health and social care and working strongly with our really vibrant voluntary sector uh, in this space. So if I can move on now, please. So. This has been developed over a significant period of time. We've had help from a, a great team at Manchester University, as I said when I when I last spoke, Professor David Gavin, colleague. We intended to go to formal consultation after the elections, but the events uh, of uh, Sarah Everard's death and so on brought that forward. And actually, since then, you know, there have been more women killed. Gracie Spinks is, 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 is obviously a, a most in our minds at the moment, but there have been other women. And there have also been the Ofsted report on schools, uh, which suggested that actually sexual harassment of girls and uh, young women in particular is endemic in our education system. And last week we saw the rape review, um, which catalogued the fact that in the victim commissioner's words, the prosecution of rape in this country has all but collapsed with thousands and thousands of women constantly let down um, by the criminal justice system uh, and the you know, charging rate of something like 1.6 percent uh, on average across the country. So we put this out, as I said, for informal consultation. It's the next slide there, please. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't see it. So as a result of that um, consultation, we've got about 65 responses in. 
Um, one of the contested issues is what we should actually call this strategy. Um, the, there is a range of views, uh, some arguing for violence against women and girls, which is very much a kind of women's sector view, uh, uh, and others arguing that that, that should be something like gender-based. We've decided to adopt the UN definition uh, and, and title, which is gender-based violence. Um, and that really is to uh, underscore the fact that structural gender-based power differentials place women and girls at much greater risk of this form of violence, but recognising also that some men and boys are subject to it too. But this phase of the consultation opened up actually a lot of very welcome contact with, with much smaller voluntary organisations organizations who can help us um, understand more the experience of women from the minority ethnic communities, um, establishing links with local authorities to work together to provide housing, care and support for victims of domestic abuse, uh, adopting the uh, shared sector core standards developed by a range of organisations, and particularly uh, in the light of the Ofsted report, working with schools and teachers specifically, uh, inviting them to training events and so on. So there's some, been some, some changes uh, on those lines. Next one, please. So the formal consultation is launched today um, and that will continue until the 1st of August. There'll be a web-based questionnaire uh, seeking views on, on those uh, issues there, the priorities, the name again, the particular substantive uh, proposals in each chapter and anything else anybody wants, uh, wants to tell us. There will also be, uh, next slide please, there will also be in this if more formal consultation period we will go out and seek the views of some very uh, specific people and groups of people. We'll have one-to-one -one interviews with female victims of sexual violence and of domestic abuse, and with female migrant victims of domestic abuse. We'll be holding focus groups with a wide range of people, and some of them are listed there. And we'll garner those views from those um, in-depth, really, qualitative, discussions with people who have a stake in this very important uh, subject. So we're hoping that uh, you, through your media, will, will help us get the message across to people. It really is important, this is the learning we've taken from other places, to get the community really to take up this issue, to feel involved with it, uh, and to help us implement what will be a very challenging uh, strategy to deliver. It's multifaceted faceted, um, and it's difficult. It's difficult territory. Um, but that's why we, we want to involve our community in this. And uh, as I say, that cons consultation starts today. Thank you, Andy. Thanks so much <clears throat> indeed, uh, Bev. So just um, a couple of uh, words from me to finish, uh, and then we'll open up to all of your your questions. Um, just to give you an update on the um, the ban introduced by the Scottish Government on non-essential travel between Manchester, Salford um, and Scotland, which was announced on Friday, came in yesterday, uh, adding to the pre-existing ban on Salford. Um, <clears throat> it was discussed at our Greater Manchester Emergency uh, Committee uh, this morning. And <clears throat> I think a key issue that's coming out is, is the exit route. Uh, because the leader of Bolton Council um, uh, needs to know, uh, in his words, you know what, 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 where they stand. As you saw from the slide that Richard presented at the start, Bolton's cases have fallen now quite quickly over the last uh, week. Uh, so today they're at uh, 250, um, and you compare that with the latest figures we have for, say, Dundee. Uh, currently over 300. So, you know, how long does this ban stay in place on Bolton? And what would be the exit route for Manchester and, and Salford? And we're unclear on that at the moment. It doesn't feel fair to us that Bolton uh, should be uh, still under uh, this uh, ban. And as you know, we have concerns about its disproportionate uh, effect on, on, on people's arrangements. So certainly we need clarity on what is the the criteria for lifting uh, this and uh, 
uh, releasing uh, the boroughs uh, from this uh, from this ban. Just in terms of um, you know the level of uh, public uh, concern that's been raised with us, we've had over 50 emails now sent in to my office at the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, and a number of them are giving very specific examples of how it has had a pretty significant impact uh, on people's lives. I'll just give you three examples. One individual due to marry at Gretna Green in early July, uh, and then tour Scotland uh, for, uh, for for honeymoon, uh, has obviously had that cancelled and, and is unable to get a £500 uh, refund. Uh, that's one example that's come in today. Another is a, a, a group of uh, walkers from Greater Manchester, all of whom are double jabbed, who are already in Scotland uh, and are unsure of what they what they should do, and they don't know uh, where they where they stand. Uh, a third example: a, a family due to visit Scotland uh, to scatter um, the ashes of a loved one uh, have now said that they've had to postpone their trip, and that obviously has an, an emotional impact alongside everything else. From a business point of view, we have uh, been made aware of one hotel in Greater Manchester which has reported the loss of 200 room nights. So 200 room nights being cancelled uh, as, as a result, and we're seeking wider analysis from the hotel sector. So the impact is real. Um, I anticipate having the opportunity to discuss it uh, with the First Minister tomorrow. Uh, and obviously we will want clarity on elements of the policy that are currently unclear to us in terms of the criteria uh, that are being used here, the, the exit strategy, the, lift, the process for lifting these uh, restrictions uh, on the boroughs uh, affected, but also to, to see how we might strengthen communications uh, going forward between this devolved administration here in Greater Manchester and indeed the Scottish, uh, the Scottish Government. So that's an update on that issue for you colleagues. Uh, Jimmy is going to take us through your questions today. So without further ado, uh, Jimmy, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Andy. So if colleagues from the media would, as some already have, raise your hands. And in a moment, we'll get underway with questions. Thank you. OK, so um, I think the first I'll come to is um, Ellie Linford. Ellie, you should be able to unmute yourself now and uh, please introduce yourself and your media organisation and then ask your question. Hi, I'm Eloise Linford from HITS Radio. I think this one is directed towards Bev. Um, in regards to the gender-based violence strategy, how are you planning to make improvements in terms of conviction rates when we know they're so low for things like domestic abuse? And do you have a particular strategy for protecting victims at the minute as we know cases rise when England play? Yes, thanks, Ali. Um, really important questions. We, we have, notwithstanding the national situation, we have actually done a lot of work ourselves locally on um, trying to make sure that we can improve on the charging and then the prosecution and conviction rates for serious sexual offences of all kinds. Uh, I convened and chaired a, a round table that worked over a period of months and through that involving the police and the Crown Prosecution Service and the court service, as well as some voluntary organisations. Um, we've had a strategy to try and improve those rates and they have improved uh, here. Um, things like the, the, the quality of the file that uh, the police send to the Crown Prosecution Service. We've made massive improvements in that through training of police officers so that what the CPS get is, is a better document, better set of documents with the evidence of the file of a particular case so they can make a quicker decision um, in terms of charging and, and prosecution. Uh, a lot of training going on across the piece too to try and improve that. I think um, it's fair to say that the current situation in the courts uh, as a result of COVID, backlog of cases, the fact that we cannot try uh, some cases easily in courts because of the social distancing requirements. That has had a very unwelcome uh, impact. It's not something we can do a lot about, but it has had um, a, a, an impact. And in terms of um, supporting victims, I'm currently overseeing a, a complete review of all the 
services for victims that I commission. I get money from the Ministry of Justice to commission services for victims. We're reviewing all of that in the light of our new strategy to make sure that we can um, offer a really good service to, to, to any victims of these crimes. Currently, we do not reach very well people from black and minority ethnic groups. And that's why working with some of the organisations who've come forward has been very, very important. So we'll be recommissioning those services over the next six months or so uh, with, with a view to making sure that we can fill the gaps uh, and make sure that we reach all of those victims and provide them with a really supported service. Thank you. Thank you, Bev. Thank you, Ellie. Um, next, we'll come to Kevin Fitzpatrick. Uh, Kevin, you should be able to unmute your microphone now. If you could introduce yourself and your media organisation and ask your question, please. Kevin, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? OK, Kevin. I shall come back to you then, Kevin, and instead Go to uh, Maya Wolf Robinson. Uh, Maya, you should be able to unmute yourself now, I hope. Yeah. Hi, uh, um, this is a question for Andy or Richard um, about kids self isolating in schools. Um, firstly, do you know where, uh, how the numbers in Greater Manchester um, compare to nationally? I know that um, the number of children self isolating in Oldham is several times the national average. But I'm just trying to get an idea if we're the worst area in the country. Um, and then part of that is, do you think that there's a level of complacency in government about the thousands of children um, in Greater Manchester and in the North West who are missing so much school, especially given that the direct contact testing um, pilot that Richard referred to, I think it's not due to report until the end of this month, which means that the guidance for schools won't be put into place until September, as far as I understand. So it would be too late for, you know, this term. Um, and so just generally, what do you think should be done about that? Do you support a change in self-isolation in schools? Some schools are still doing things like the kids have to self-isolate, even if they've had two negative PCR tests, um, which doesn't see necessarily in line with what national guidance and what's happening elsewhere. Richard? Yeah, uh, our, our numbers, uh, I couldn't give you an exact comparison, but the numbers in Greater Manchester are worse than the national uh, national average, but you would expect that simply because uh, our total number of uh, cases is uh, greater than the, uh, the national average. So I think that's uh, an, an inevitable consequence of that. Um, uh, in terms of uh, complacency with, within uh, government, I, I say you're, you're right about the reporting time scale for uh, that particular uh, pilot. Uh, we do think we ought to be able to move to a position where if we can test on a daily basis and you get a negative uh, test that we shouldn't need to self-isolate. We're trying to look at a few other ways of minimising the self-isolation, but uh, whatever we do over the next few weeks, we all already know that uh, an enormous young number of young people have lost an enormous amount of school schooling. Uh, that that is worse in the more de deprived parts of the conurbation, and that what government is offering in terms of catch up for those young people is risable. Really, it's, it is completely inadequate for uh, for for needs. So, uh, I know the government has talked about more money being made uh, available, but uh, seem to ignore the fact that schools need to be able to plan, they need to be able to put arrangements in place, they need some notice, not to a little bit of dribble money here here or there. So uh, I think what government was presented with was, uh, uh, I think, a, a highly uh, well supported, well thought out, long term plan for uh, recovery. Uh, that's what government needs to be funding. And so schools can uh, and other agencies can plan, plan ahead and make sure uh, that those young people can catch up. And there does need to be an emphasis on uh, the more deprived parts of the conurbation where if unless young people get that support that they are just going to fall further behind. So I, I think it's, it's worse than complacency. It is, I, I think it's a mixture of uh, uh, in, inadequacy and incompetence in that we don't have those packages in place. 
Thank you, Richard. Andy, did you want to come in at all? No, it's OK, Jimmy. <clears throat> Thank you. OK, uh, thanks for that question. I think next, um, uh, Jen Williams, I'll um, allow your mic. Jen, you should be able to unmute yourself now. And if you just introduce yourself and where you're from, please. Hi, uh, yes, it's uh, Jen Williams from the Manchester Evening News. Um, I've got a question for Andy and then um, one for Andy and Richard. Um, it's about the, the question to Andy is about the, uh, the Manchester Arena inquiry, which I realise uh, isn't over yet, but we've had some initial conclusions that have been critical uh, of lots of aspects of the response um, and preparations, including GMPs. And in the evidence, uh, we heard that one of the key commanders on the night was criticised for providing no meaningful tactical command, failing to set up a silver control room and failing to set up a casualty bureau. He also hadn't read the forces command guide and didn't know what Plato was. So in light of that, do you think that the report produced for you by Lord Kerslake after the attack was too soft uh, on the police? And to both Andy and Richard, could we get a bit of an update on vaccine supply? I know a couple of weeks ago um, you'd been asking government to accelerate it. How much did you ask to be brought forward across GM um, by the government and how much has actually been forthcoming? Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jen. So I'll, I'll let Richard take the second question. I'll, I'll take the first. Obviously, we did get the first report from uh, the inquiry last week. And as I said, uh, this is a report that we will uh, consider extremely carefully uh, and we will take on board all of its all of its findings. Uh, we were encouraged uh, that it endorsed uh, the call of, of Fegan Murray and, and other uh, families for um, what Fegan has always called Martin's Law. Uh, but the protect duty, as, as the government now say, and I think this is um, this, this is real progress. If, if we can now build that consensus around venue uh, security and make some make some real changes, you you reference specifics, uh, Jen, which which I think will be kind of picked up in later stages uh, of the of the inquiry. Uh, and in that regard, obviously, I have to have a regard that there is an ongoing legal uh, legal process here. But the specific question you asked me was about obviously the Kerslake report and the work that it did compared to the inquiry. We were always very clear that they had two distinct roles. Um, we knew obviously straight in the aftermath of the um, of the attack that there would be some time before a formal public inquiry inquest could have completed its work. But we needed in that moment to, to, to be honest with ourselves about what had happened on the night and as best we could begin to um, uh, to, to learn from uh, what happened and to strengthen our own preparedness, our own readiness uh, for any any future events. And I think the Kurzlake report helped us do that. Certainly, you'll remember it. Um, it instigated a whole series of work with regard to our fire service, but also with the, with the police as well. Uh, so you know, the Kerslake report did what we wanted from it, which was not the comprehensive uh, uh, detail that will be unre revealed by the inquest, but that kind of take first look at what happened and what could be done so that we could strengthen our arrangements as quickly as we possibly uh, could. And I believe we have done that uh, on the back of the Kerslake report, particularly in relation to Great Manchester Fire and Rescue uh, Service. I'll hand over to Richard uh, for the second part of the question, Jen, if that's OK. Uh, uh, thanks, Jen. Um, we, we're certainly, from a Greater Manchester perspective, are not getting the speed of response that we saw uh, for Bolton a few weeks uh, ago. And so not begrudging Bolton uh, that, I'm really pleased that their numbers are going in the uh, right direction. but. We had expected that certainly we would get similar levels of resource for other parts of Greater Manchester where cases were rising uh, rapidly. So uh, we're hoping that the first request for military support will be signed off in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. They've not been signed off uh, yet and they've been sitting there for uh, at least a week and a half uh, now. And in terms of vaccine supply, that for, we've got adequate vaccine supply for second doses for uh, over 40s. Uh, we haven't got the accelerated vaccine supply yet uh, that we will need for people in cohorts uh, 11 and uh, 12. Uh, the only extra vaccine that has been received is uh, 10,000 doses that we received in uh, Manchester last week. But to put that in perspective, uh, in the 
target areas in Manchester alone, there are 30,000 18 to 29 year olds that we will be seeking to uh, vaccine, ideally within a, a three week period of time. So we are not getting vaccine at the speed we need it in order to be able to uh, address the problems we face. Thank you, Richard, thank you, Richard. And, and thank you, Jen. Um, next, I think I'll go to uh, Dan Sanderson. Dan, uh, bear with me one second. You should be able, Dan, to unmute yourself now. If you could introduce yourself and your outlet and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, how's Dan Sanderson here from the Daily Telegraph? Um, yeah, I was just hoping, Andy, to say a bit more about, you said you were speaking to Nicola Surgeon tomorrow. Can you, if you just say a bit more about how that came about, you know, who reached out to who? Um, and you've also you've obviously raised a lot of concerns about the impact of the travel ban on on your constituents. But I wonder what your message is to Scots who were perhaps planning to come to to some of the affected areas in in Greater Manchester. Um, you know, are, are they still welcome? Would you still encourage them to come? Um, and can I also just ask Bev, uh, given given your remit, what you make of the policy, and you know whether the police in Greater Manchester will will be paying any attention at all to it or, or are they simply going to ignore it? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> I'll let Bev take the point about GMP and their ability to do anything about this because that was discussed uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> on the message that I would give to people in, in Scotland, I mean, obviously we are disappointed that people can't uh, visit. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it has had a real impact on uh, on hotels. I gave one one example. I, I suppose what I'm not going to do on this call, Dan, is uh, contradict um, the position of the the Scottish government. Um, I wouldn't feel responsible for me to uh, uh, me to do that. We are raising concerns about the policy, its implementation, the lack of prior notification. I mean, the reason the reason why those issues are real. It's not just a, you know well feeling slighted that we weren't informed, you know, because it hasn't been explained to us, we're not in a position really to give people messages. Sorry, my, my lights have just uh, just uh, gone out here. We're not in a position to um, give people um, clear uh, messages, either, you know, the residents of Greater Manchester or indeed people in Scotland, because we don't know the rationale uh, for this. Um, it hasn't been fully explained. Um, and, and hence, it's a difficult position, I think, that we um, that we find ourselves in. You know, the fact that there still has been no contact with the um, with the Scottish government directly. Um, but as I, I don't want to go into all details, but I believe there will be an opportunity for us to discuss these issues uh, properly uh, tomorrow. And I'm seeking resolution of them, not seeking prolonged uh, debate about things or argument. We just want to seek resolution and a better way of doing things. Uh, going forward, you know, it has been the case that there's been restrictions in Wales, but they've been done in a, a sense where people had forward sight of the restrictions. The difference here is things came in at very, very short notice. They weren't communicated. And I think that has then had a, a direct impact. And there is the kind of sense that this is inconsistent. You know, Bolton today at 250 cases um, per 100,000. You know, and falling, and I'd expect it to be. I would expect it to be lower by the end of the week. I don't know for certain, but I, on the trend, it looks like it will be. When does the ban get lifted? I mean, we really do, do need to know an answer to that question. But I'll hand over to Bev from the sort of enforcement uh, side. There's a pretty clear answer that you're about to get, actually, because we we have checked it with the chief constable, and uh, Bev will be able to update you on that. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yes, Dan, we 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 touched uh, we touched base on this particular question with the Chief Constable at the COVID committee uh, meeting this morning. Um, and as we anticipated, really, I mean, he's he's got no, um, he's, he's got no remit, he's got no leverage. I mean, it, it's impossible uh, for, for him to police this issue, even if he wanted to. I mean, you know, what, what would we do? Have a board around Greater Manchester and stop people who are crossing it to see if they, you know, where they're going? It was just, it's just practically impossible uh, for us to enforce. Um, he's also made some informal contact with colleagues, uh, similar position in Scotland, in the police there. Uh, and I think uh, they too um, are feeling that it's very difficult for them uh, to enforce in Scotland uh, as well. So I think there'll be a very, very um, 
let's say low-key approach um, to this given the circumstances uh, and that's as much as we can say really we've got no basis for any any other approach thank you Bev. um sorry andy did you want to come back in no no it's okay Jimmy. super okay so uh, next i think i'll come to greg russell yeah. greg give me a second you should be able now greg to unmute yourself if you could introduce yourself and where you're from and then ask your question thank you are you having any joy unmuting yourself greg yeah, that's been a greg so, russell thank from you. the national in scotland and it's a question for andy um you, you're meeting nicola sturgeon is the threat of legal action still there and isn't it just as she suggested and others have suggested, this is you positioning yourself for a, a possible uh, leadership challenge? Um, thanks, Greg. Well, I think I find it you know, disappointing that issues of substance could just be dismissed in that way because um, it kind of suggests that we've kind of what we're saying is valueless and it's all manufactured. Well, Honestly, don't think you can say that on the back of some of the information that I've given to you this afternoon, because um, this has had a real impact on people's lives. It's had a real impact on businesses. Um, you know, this is a big city that we're speaking to you from. You know, this is a big city that wants to get back to a degree of normality, given uh, the, the, the times we've been through. Uh, it's had it's had a real impact. Um, and obviously it has an impact beyond the UK because other people around the world will see the, the announcement that's been uh, been made. So I, I just think that's unfortunate that that allegation gets made because obviously it just seeks to diminish all of the issues that I've raised. Well, I, I think there are real there are real uh, issues um, that, that need to be um, properly considered. You know, we have our differences with the UK government, but they have generally got in touch with us to discuss what they were planning to do uh, beforehand um, and where they have tried to put us under restrictions without support we have we have said we don't think that is right and the same obviously applies to the to the Scottish government so I, I want to pursue another route the, the political route is the route to pursue to pick up the other part of your question um, and that's obviously what uh, we would seek to do uh, tomorrow uh, to to put in place better dialogue, better lines of communication, which clearly aren't, aren't there at the moment. But, um, you know, I, 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 to, you know, to, to have a situation where one of the ten boroughs of Greater Manchester is under a, a, a travel ban imposed by the Scottish Government, when there are parts of Scotland with now a significantly higher case rate that isn't under similar arrangements, that we are entitled to ask why. And it is not necessarily fair to then say in asking why that's all about an ulterior political uh, ish strategy i don't think that is the way we should be conducting uh, th this discussion on what is what is actually a, an important issue and i think it does raise constitutional questions here you know it, is it I, I don't know the, the answer to this but what is, is, are the legal grounds for all this quite clear because obviously you've just heard the deputy mayor talk about the position of gmp being confused you know, obviously, this is I think this is un, an unprecedented situation where it's not just, uh, you know, a, a country like Wales has done saying, look, this is our arrangements for our country. And you would expect the same for Scotland. I think the difference is when it's impacting on people outside of, you know, in terms of picking a particular area outside of the uh, the area concerned and saying to the residents of Scotland that they can't go to this, this area. So it's almost in some ways led legislating for England beyond Scotland. I mean, it's, you know, I just think it raises constitutional questions that need to be need to be considered. I'm not saying that they're necessarily problematic. And I've you know, been very clear on this call today that I am not seeking to kind of work against what the Scottish government is trying to do to protect health, to control the spread of the virus. It's got a legitimate um, role. Of course it has in, in doing that. But I think we, are, we, we all of us have to work in partnership through this unprecedented period and find ways of working that are right for both sides, particularly when the decisions of one devolved administration impact on another. And we are, as I said before, a, a, a devolved administration here in Greater Manchester of 2.8 million people. And yeah, we, we do need to find better ways of working. 
Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Greg. Uh, come now to Katie uh, Hazeldine. Katie, let me just allow your microphone. You should be able to unmute yourself now if you can introduce yourself and where you're from and ask your question, please. Hi, it's for Andy. Um, it's Katie from Lots Manchester. So just at the beginning, you were referring to some specific cases of how the Scotland travel ban um, is impacting people in Greater Manchester. And you emphasised that there was a group of walkers that had been double jabbed. Um, people are obviously doing their bit to slow the spread of this Delta variant. Do you worry about the impacts that this could have, these types of travel bans, that it may even lead to some complacency surrounding vaccine uptake if people feel that there is less of an incentive if they're still having these restrictions um, put on their lives? Well, I, I certainly, to pick up the last part of your question, Katie, I certainly feel that the public's willingness to accept restrictions that don't seem proportionate is definitely wearing out uh, and that's why I think everyone has to be careful now in terms of um, further restricting people's lives. I think if there's a clear justification for it of course people will continue to accept it because of the fatigue and particularly because people here you know the some of the people I'm talking about who gave me my examples you know they've talked about shielding for two years have been waiting for this trip all of that time double jab getting tested all of the time and then they can't go and you can understand how they feel um and, and as I say to ban people from the entirety of Scotland when they're double jabbed and in the position I've just described does feel to me um, going a little too far, perhaps from the higher case rates or from the cities, you might understand that a little more. But from the countryside, I, I you know, I find that you know quite quite hard if I were them to be able to accept. So I think the issue is here. You know, we're at a stage of the pandemic where I think all governments and public bodies need to be careful about restricting the public without you know really clear justification and having gone through all of the con consideration as to whether or not it's it's proportionate. Um, you know, it, uh, given that the law has been changed in the Scottish Parliament or is about to be, you know, it, it's clear to us that the decision was taken some while ago in Scotland and there should have been time to advance, give advance notice, inform people. Um, and you are right. I mean, the danger is obviously the public just give up on it all and say, oh, well, there's no point. We try and live by the rules. We try and do things right. And then we're still hit with restrictions that take away the things that we've been hoping you know, to go on. And obviously the for the Scottish government, I think, you know, they do need to think about tourism and what that does. You know, lots of people from here travel regularly to Scotland. And, you know, I think, you know, as I say, we need a better resolution than the one we've got right right now. But uh, there is a danger. I think there is a fatigue with restrictions. Uh, and, uh, and if we're kind of asking people to do things that go way beyond what they think are necessary, then we could lose the public's buy in to what's what's being done. Thank you, Casey. I should just alert colleagues in the media to the fact the press release about the gender based violence strategy consultation is now on the GMCA news section on our website. Um, I think we'll try. Kevin Fitzpatrick for a second time. Mm. Kevin, I can see you there. I'll allow your mic. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Introduce yourself, please, and ask your question. Thank you. Hiya. Oh, yeah. Right. Second attempt. It's Kevin at Radio Manchester. Um, a quick one from me on the hospital figures, Andy, because clearly when when the restrictions were extended for another four weeks, the, the main gist was, yes, cases are going up, but we need to keep an eye on what happens uh, with the hospital figures. Um, from the chart that Sir Richard shared, it looks like kind of the actual general admissions have dropped, although there's an increase in people in hospital who found to have COVID. Um, so so what, what are you taking from this recent week, week's hospital figures or the last couple of weeks that kind of inform us where we might be going generally? Because cases are going up, but it doesn't seem that there is that feared increase in hospitals. <coughs> Richard may want to, to add to this as well, Kevin, but um, I think it's pretty much as you describe. Um, the hospital uh, figures are, you know, nowhere near what they were um, earlier this year or, or last. Um, however, it's important not just to see COVID. Um, there is more pressure in hospitals more broadly uh, for other non-COVID conditions than there was. So it's still a concern and it can't be ignored. Um, but uh, you're right to point to that fall in, in admissions um, and the, the pressure 
uh, that is within hospitals with regard to COVID patients is there and growing a little, but we would say obviously at this stage manageable. Um, but it's obviously something that we've got to got to watch uh, watch very closely. I heard the health secretary on the radio this morning, kind of giving a similar picture with regard to England. You know that there is evidence of increase, but it's it's not causing the same level of concern that it that it has that it has before. And again, as Richard was saying, you know we we think, and the evidence we've been given this morning from our experts is that we think this kind of wave that we've seen that has been happening in the other boroughs of Greater Manchester. With, you, know, you know, Bolton went early, if you like. We think the um, the effect that we might now be seeing is a levelling off, and and hopefully uh, other boroughs will now show a similar similar trajectory to the one that we've seen in in Bolton. So, it's it's still a you know it's a it's an unclear picture. We were told today that we 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 think we are ahead of where the rest of the country will be in a couple of weeks, three weeks. You know that we have gone you know a bit earlier uh, as we did in in the autumn last year. Um, so that's that's the position as it, as it is at the moment, but it's not comparable to uh, what we've seen in hospitals at other stages of the pandemic. Richard wants to just that. yeah, if if if, if I could, um, I, I think uh, Kevin, that it, it, this is around understanding what's happening in the health and care system uh, overall. Uh, if we wanted to compare with uh, last. February, March, when there was a very real danger that our hospital system were going to fall over. And by fall over, I not be able to take uh, uh, urgent care uh, patients. We're nothing like that position at, at, at the moment, and we're very unlikely to get into that uh, position. But alongside uh, COVID, uh, we now have a programme of elective recovery taking place. There is a, a backlog of over 300,000 cases in Greater Manchester. Uh, clearly, that's going to be a, a period of time to get through that backlog, but we want to keep the work going on that backlog. And we've also seen unprecedented numbers uh, going into A&E as well. So there is more emergency care uh, taking place. And if we look at overall hospital occupancy, uh, it's in the uh, 87 to 90 percent uh, level, which is more than we would normally want to uh, have as a normal operating level. In, in effect, the overall number in the middle of June is what we would expect in the middle of winter. Uh, that's the pressure we've got on the system at, at, at the moment. But it's also, it's, as I said earlier, it's not just uh, uh, hospitals. The ambulance services are under pressure. Uh, that uh, GPs, dentists. Uh, opticians, all of those community and primary care services are under pressure as well. And this is partly because I think a lot of people, because of COVID, yes, they were feeling poorly, but they weren't going to go out. Uh, now they're feeling they, they need to go and get uh, themselves seen to, they're, they're seeking treatment, which is a, a, a good thing, but it is creating, uh, I think, what is an unprecedented pressure across the entirety of the health and uh, care system, and we're trying to manage that. And that, that's where we are at the moment. So you've got to see COVID not on its own, but see COVID alongside everything else that is happening. And basically, if we can get that COVID pressure uh, down, it frees the system up to be able to do those other things. Thank you, Richard. Um, last three questions now. We've got five or six minutes left. And the first is from Emma Gill. Emma, I'm going to allow your microphone now. You should be able to unmute yourself. And if you could introduce yourself and where you're from, please, and ask your question. Hi, it's Emma Gill from the Manchester Evening News. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah we yeah. can, Emma, yeah, no problem. Um, it was just on skills again. Um, Richard said about 2,000 now isolating in Manchester, and um, we know that it's 3,000 in Oldham. Do you have the figure, do you have any idea what it is across Greater Manchester? And from speaking to head teachers and parents we generally just get the impression that teachers are crying out head teachers are crying out for help they're sick of sending children home parents are sick of children being sent home because they're worried about the amount of education they've lost already and having to take time off work to deal with that and it just feels that in many ways we know better off than we were in the autumn in some senses we're even worse because the variant seems to be more transmissible so the people that are get the even larger groups are being sent home than before can you put more pressure on the government to change this daily covid testing so that they can take part in it for the rest of this academic year because 
otherwise we're facing the rest of this term being a complete write-off for thousands of children. I'll start off, Andy. I, I, it's difficult, obviously, for any of us to speak uh, uh, about the entirety of Greater Manchester because they are 10 different uh, school systems. But I think the messages we are picking up is that uh, what I've described for Manchester, what you've just described for all of them, is reflected pretty much across uh, the whole of Greater Manchester. Uh, I do know that uh, our Director of Education and Executive Member for Children's Services are reporting exactly what you've described, that uh, head teachers feeling that they are under phenomenal pressure and that they are crying out for uh, for help. And it is that difficulty of uh, uh, teachers teaching classes when uh, the, the composition of the class can change from uh, what well, does change from uh, day day to day, but of, uh, having maybe teaching three children in the room and the rest of the class are all on remote uh, remote learning. It's it's making it, I think almost impossible for uh, head teachers and teachers to manage. So they are crying out out for help. I uh, I think you have to be careful. There is uh, we discussed this previously. There is a pilot uh, taking place, and uh, I think. We all uh, think that if you're going to do a pilot because of the health implications, you've got to do the pilot and validate it before you can start rolling it out uh, uh, everywhere. But we certainly, if that pilot is shown to be working, we would like to get, get it ro rolled out as quickly as possible. Because uh, although we, we would expect by September, uh, the level of transmission ought to have diminished, it's not going to have disappeared altogether. So I think this is still going to be an issue in the autumn and we do need long term solutions for it. Absolutely. I mean, just to add, <clears throat> we can try and get the figures, Emma, if we, you know, if if, if uh, Jimmy or someone in the team could just see if there are there is a, a GM figure, but it, there is a real issue here. And um, as Richard was saying, I think it does need more practical solutions. Um, if if uh, you know the pilot does do what we hope it will, you know, this, bear in mind this is often a asymptomatic children and asymptomatic contacts, and I think you know maybe. You know, a more proportionate approach to the management of all of that. You know, no one needs, no one should be taking any risks with the spread of the virus. So obviously, if people are testing positive, then that that is a, a an issue that needs to be dealt with. But I think when it comes to the contacts of those those kids, then maybe there are other arrangements that can be can be looked at. Thank you, Andy. Just a couple more questions, and then we're done. The first is from Michael Gaffney. Michael, you should be able to unmute yourself now. If you could introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Hi, uh, Michael Gaffney, LBC. Uh, this one for Andy and Sir Richard. Um, it's Windrush Day today, and of course, it's a, a reminder that because of things like the hostile environment, we've got some people in our African and Caribbean community who've frankly got quite good reason to be a bit reticent about engaging with the state. Um, my question is are we doing enough to make sure that doesn't undermine the vaccine rollout and stop? already at risk communities from getting the protection from COVID that they have every right to. I'll leave this one for Richard, I think, because obviously there is you know, an issue in parts of South Manchester in terms of we need to up, increase uptake. But uh, Richard, shall I? Well, oh, yeah, and uh, conversations with uh, Lucy Powell and her constituency, I think, has had more uh, cases related to Windrush than any other part of the country. So it really is an issue for uh, South Central uh, Manchester and perhaps adjacent parts of Trafford as well, where there is still a significant uh, Afro-Caribbean uh, population. Uh, and as a, a council, we're working uh, extensively with uh, uh, community organisations, including the Caribbean African Health Network, uh, to We've been doing that for four years to support the community in dealing with the pretty dire consequences of them from the government's approach to uh, Windrush uh, cases. So we will continue uh, to do that. But as I said, we are working with a community based health network to make sure that we can overcome those obstacles and uh, and get get the vaccination rate up in a, a community that the data tells us has been quite resistant to uh, uh, vaccination so far. So it, it is a real issue. Uh, we are working uh, very hard on it, both our public health and Manchester Health and Care Commissioning, but as you would ex expect that we are working through uh, people that the community will have confidence uh, within, including people from the community itself. Jimmy, could I um, just say something else prompted by <clears throat> Michael's question 
uh, which is important because people describe what might be about to happen as being similar to Windrush, and that is the requirement on EU nationals living in Greater Manchester or indeed anywhere in the UK to register with the Home Office uh, by the 30th of June. So the deadline is now fast approaching. And if people don't register, it could, for instance, affect entitlement to benefits or other forms of support. Uh, so I think it is really important uh, to use this uh, press briefing today to ask you all, if you can, uh, to convey the message that any EU nationals living here uh, who are critical actually right now to our social care sector, which obviously has got many EU nationals working within it, or as Richard was talking about earlier today, hospitality, where we know um, the businesses are struggling to, to recruit staff at the moment. You know, we, 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 need, um, we need you to know about the deadline, but we also want you to sort of also um, put your affairs in, in good order uh, so that um, there's no, no issues uh, further, down, further down the line. So that, that deadline is fast approaching. And actually people, Michael, do describe it as being a sort of, you know, a, a form of the Windrush um, situation uh, in a different context if people you know, don't register uh, in, in time. And there may be communities where they still haven't realised what, the, what they've got to. I think it's a fairly simple process, but it does need to be done uh, over the next seven days. So really grateful if media colleagues could, could uh, remind Greater Manchester communities about that. Thank you, Andy. The final question then, just before you conclude, uh, this is from Alex Mislin. Uh, Alex, you should be able to unmute yourself. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Hi, Andy. Um, I'm Alex from Alex Mislin from The Guardian. Um, I mean, you said earlier that this row with the Scottish Government raises constitutional questions. Um, do you feel existing processes are liable to leave yourself and the people of Greater Manchester frozen out of key decisions that impact them and have you been in touch with you know your fellow leaders of devolved administrations about this? Oh, certainly others have contacted me because obviously they've seen this and it because it could impact on on others so uh, you know people are kind of interested in you know what what the um, the resolution is is going forward I mean all the way through the pandemic Alex I've said that there is a need for <clears throat> uh, for involvement at the UK level of all forms of devolved administrations. Now they can be you know, national governments, as we have in Scotland, but also you know uh, a, a regional devolved body of the kind that is the GMCA. So I think what this is exposed is a sort of a you know obviously these are new arrangements, and the country as a I don't think the country yet has woken up to the fact that it's got these new uh, regional devolved entities and it and other parts of the system have not amended the, the ways that they work to, to recognize uh, to recognize that I could include the Labour Party in that if, I, if I'm honest uh, you know there's there's a lot of catching up uh, to be done here um, but I think you know through the pandemic I think the importance of these regional devolved bodies has become clearer uh, to people so you know the UK now needs to make sure that you know it, where decisions are being made, all of those, uh, all of those uh, voices are properly represented. I, I think there was a, a kind of uh, an explanation came from some in the Scottish government to say, well, they told the UK government, but you know that isn't the same as telling myself or Sir Richard or the city mayor of Salford uh, or the leader of Bolton. You know, it, it, it's clearly there's this has exposed a, a, a gap. But it's also the case of you know what what is the situation when there's regulations passed in the Scottish Parliament. You know what? What is the position of Greater Manchester Police, for instance, in relation to those? Uh, you know, we believe we feel we know what it is, but it, it clearly is a little a little unclear, and that's hence the constitutional question arises. So, um, you know, we, we're seeking just to resolve them. You know, obviously we've said what we've said. Um, we we've made our position clear, but it's now about moving these things towards a, a resolution, um, and we hope we can do that over the next uh, the next couple of days. Good. Well, thank Jimmy. Shall I just thank everybody for for attending? Um, and I think there's only one. Well, there's two things for me to say before I let you all all, all go. Or three things. Thank you for coming as ever and for your, your interest. Uh, but the, the two further things to say certainly are good luck England tonight and good luck Scotland. And on that note, I'll let you all go.